Yeah, it stopped. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. Okay. Hello, Guru Nation. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us on our monthly webinar. Uh, I got Chris Sauber here. Chris. Hello. What's up, sir? Well, not a whole lot. This topic is your expertise. Expertise. Right up your alley. Right. Mm. So we actually did, uh, yeah, we actually did a video on this recently. Right. That was good. Yeah, we did a half an hour video. Yeah, and I think somewhere in the video, because we were standing up, uh, you know, we decided to do a webinar one of these days, sure. just so we could go a little more in depth. And by the way, for anyone that's here, you may uh, chat. Okay, so if you have a question. You can chat if you actually want to, uh, if you want everyone to hear your voice and ask the question, just chat that you want to be unmuted and I will unmute you, all right? And uh, this will be on YouTube as well, okay? So, okay, first of all, why did we want to do this topic? What was the inspiration behind it? We receive a number of questions from our clients. Uh, about this particular topic. It, uh, typically, they're research naive and they really do not know the processes, in, processes involved in research. And we got sick of explaining the same thing over. over and over and over. And for those of you that don't know, we do consulting. We actually own our own research clinics, uh, but we also do a good deal of consulting uh, where we help sites, many of them brand new sites, so it's understandable that they would ask these questions. But some are established and they're still asking these questions. So, And, and this is great for people who um, may not have new sites, but maybe like a new coordinator or a new PI uh, or even a monitor, right? Oh my God, I would hope a monitor would know. An entry-level mo entry CRA. You would hope they would know at least some of this. I would hope they would know. But hey, entry level? Sure. I don't know. Well, entry level means they've typically been a CRC, I would think, in their past uh, career life. Not necessarily, but I guess 50% of the time that would be true. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they get lucky and get hired as entry level CRAs with, with just a degree. And no experience. Yeah, yeah. No. Sometimes the these CROs and sponsors want to mold these people, so they don't want them sure. to have been uh, contaminated sure. with someone else's bad processes. No bad, no bad habits. Uh, we can't hear you. That's not good. I see that the mic is working. Can you still hear? Not here. Okay, so I can see that the mic is working. So... Okay, so there might be some, even some CRAs who, okay. yeah, now they can. So there might be some CRAs who even don't know what this is. So let's try to go back to that video. What did we start off with? So this is what to do before you have your first visit uh, at, at a site, as a site. So you got the study. So we're making the assumption that, uh, that they have the study. CDAs in place. Uh, feasibility questionnaire has been completed. Site selection visits been done. Um, budget and contracts have been negotiated. Are, are we assuming all of this? Yes, they have the study. Okay, so site initiation visit has occurred or has not? Uh, let's do both. We have half an hour to kill. Well, let's let's just kill half an hour. Let's just say it hasn't occurred. Okay, site initiation visit has not occurred yet. Studies in place, regulatory documentation that's been completed? Yes. Okay. So the next step would be once everything is done, again, site, the site selection visit's been done, the, um, the site's been chosen, and the budgets and contracts have been finalized, negotiated and finalized. Uh, the regulatory documentation's been completed. Um, so the next step is the CRA is going to want to schedule a time to meet with both the CRC and the PI and any other, oftentimes any other uh, individuals that are 
uh, involved in the research uh, study to a, a great extent. Um, they'll want to meet with every, everybody if that's necessary uh, to the trial, if possible. But at the very least, they're going to want to meet with the PI and the CRC. So the, the sites will need to schedule a time that works for both for everybody, those three entities, the CRA, the PI, and the CRC. Um, and to prep for that visit, um, there's a few things that will need to be done. You'll want to file the regulatory documents in the regulatory binder. Um, <clears throat> and you'll want to prepare other regulatory documentation, the delegation of duties log. So are you okay, Dan? Yeah. <laughs> there you go, Chris. Thank you. You're welcome. So you want to prepare the delegation of duties, um, and that's where the PI assigns duties to uh, the individuals beneath him or her uh, to perform activities on the study. Um, and these duties that are assigned need to be need to correspond to the requirements of the sponsor or CRO, as well as education level. And that, what I mean by that is if let's say for example the pi wants to delegate um, a physical exam that cannot be delegated to somebody who has a bachelor's degree say or a high school degree it must be to somebody that's trained and licensed to conduct physical exams so it's just it has to meet requirements and oftentimes these requirements change from study to study um, oftentimes, uh, with the sites that we own, we, we participate in studies for schizophrenia. And right here, we got a question. We'll get back to this. So we received the question, does the sponsor send a delegation template or is that something the site needs to come up with? Yes. The sponsor sends a delegation template or the CRO and all the site needs to do is fill it out. And they do this so that they can have uh, standardized forms across all the sites for that study, especially when it comes to regulatory documents. That is important. Yes, and I'd like to add to that. If you are new to research, um, obviously, Dan or I could answer a question that you may have about the delegation log. But that being said, um, while monitors would prefer this is done prior to the site initiation visit, they will help you with it. Um, they're not a, completely opposed. It's just a matter of it, it takes added time to the visit and they would prefer it's done prior. But if you're uncertain of some requirements, as I was about to say, with schizophrenia trials, the requirements for the individual assessments, and there's a lot of assessments in the schizophrenia trial, uh, for example, the PANS, uh, the requirements of, of education level and experience change from trial to trial, as most other assessments involved with schizophrenia. They change from trial to trial. So for one study, one rater may be qualified, and for another study, they may, may not be qualified. And, it, and you may not know what those qualifications are, although they will tell, they will tell you if you ask, but it, let's say you're filling out the delegation of duties log the day before the site initiation visit. You may just want to wait to assign who's going to do certain scales because you may not know the requirements. And you can ask that of your monitor when they arrive to your, at your site. Again, it's, it's, it's a little bit cons more considerate, though, to have this completed prior to their arrival just because this is going to take extra time from your CRA. Um, okay, so the delegation to do these log needs to be completed, or at least would be is preferred to have it completed. Um, and then everything else needs to be filed. You also want to, most often you'll have received uh, shipments of what's being tested for the trial, whether it's uh, a medical device or uh, an, invest an investigational product like um, a pharmaceutical. Uh, pills or whatnot. Is there another question? No, not right now. So uh, you'll need to complete uh, your IP logs as well. Um, and what that involves is there's logs in which they want every, uh, let's just use um, uh, <clears throat> bottles of pills uh, for an example. Each bottle will have a unique identifier on it. 
um, and that will need to be entered in the log. Each each bottle of pills will need to be their unique identifier will need to be entered into the IP log, as well as other uh, information is sought. And again, this this is standardized throughout the trial. You don't need to create this; they will provide this. Um, and again, this varies from study to study. What particular information and what entered into the log, you just need to fill it out. Log. Um, in regards to what there's what information is being sought, um, <clears throat> that also needs to be completed, or pre it's preferred to be completed before your CRA arrives. And there shouldn't be any questions for this. This is pretty straightforward. Um, is there anything else that needs to be completed? At the SIV. Prior to the SIV, I think that's uh, it. You want to make sure you have all your. You want to make sure you have all your lab kits. Did you already say that? No, I was just saying regulatory documents. A oh, regulatory, yeah, I think we covered the regulatory. Delegation. Right, right. Well, that's those two items, the IP log and the delegation log, those are not things that you send. So when you complete your regulatory documents, those are sent to the CRO or sponsor, the originals typically, although once in a while you will keep the originals and send copies. But typically you make copies, you keep the copies, you file those in the regulatory binder. Um, most often you don't send... Uh, your IP log or, or your delegation of duties log. So you just need to be aware of that and complete it prior to your monitor arriving. Um, so let's say you've done that and the monitor arrives to your site. The purpose of that visit is to make sure everything is in place and in order for you to see a patient. And so they're going to check, hey, have you received IP? Yes, um, we have. Has it been entered in the IP log? Yes, here it is. Um, have you completed your delegation of duties log? Yes, here it is. And of course, if you haven't, the CRA is going to want it done. Um, and it has to be done prior to you seeing a patient. They won't give their approval for the site to see a patient until these things are in order. And then they're also going to check to make sure that all other additional materials required to do the study are there. Like Dan had said, lab kits. Uh, shipping boxes, just is it, has the site received everything necessary to con conduct the trial? Uh, are you bored? No, <laughs> great. This is bad, but these people need to hear this. They do, yeah, okay. And actually, I have a personal story. So, uh, thank you, Chris. So, once you start seeing patients, you don't want to lose the study, right? That's rule number one do not lose the study. Sure. We had a client, brand new site. They had they were excited because they had their first study. And they wanted to make money. They were waiting a long time to get initiated. So they enrolled like 30 patients, right? You know this without getting into specific details, sure. right? Um, it was one of those studies where you could enroll a high volume of patients, mm -hmm. right? Now, they did this. They screened like 30 patients mm -hmm. within a week. Yeah. They repeated the same consenting errors for most of the patients. Yeah, but we're not consenting yet in this process. But oh, we're not consenting? You're, okay, you're, so, you're so, okay, so we will get to that because it's 1215. So. Oh, okay, we'll move along. Is there anything else we want to add pre-SIV? I was in the SIV. Okay. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> so the SIV, um, so the, the CRE is on site. They're just there to make sure everything's in order to start seeing patients. Um, everything's been received. Your source documents are prepared. <clears throat> At least your screening source documents are prepared. You received approval from the IRB to conduct the trial. You received your informed consent. You have it. Um, now, you need to be aware of this as well, because while monitors are experienced typically, um, they're still human beings, so they may forget to check something. So make sure that, you know, at your site level that you have everything that, that's necessary to conduct the trial. Uh, don't leave it strictly up to your monitor to check this. You want to check as well, because they may miss something. And you don't want to bring a patient into your site, and guess what? You don't have IRB approval to conduct the trial, and you have no informed consent. Uh, you're going to have to send that patient home. Um, so you want to make sure as well that everything's in order. Okay, so let's just assume that everything isn't. Well, first off, if everything's not in order, you will not be given the go-ahead to see a patient. Um, say let, your site hasn't received the necessary lab kits. 
the monitor will that will be an action item they will leave they will say please send me verification uh, once you have received the lab kits so i can send approval for you to start seeing patients um so if something's not in order that will be an action item that will need to be completed prior to being allowed to see patients but let's assume so you've everything's in order the cra then says to you uh i'm speaking in general terms here you uh says to you that uh, everything's in order you can start seeing patients tomorrow okay so patient comes in and the first thing that's done is inform consent and we'll get back into the story but there has there was a question uh there's actually two so let's go with those so it says speaking of scales who does for rheumatology trials for example the joint counts Okay, is it the doctor or the doctor assistant? And when it comes down to scales, rating scale, no matter what therapeutic indication you're dealing with, you're going to have some uh, study-specific assessments. Okay, so the answer is who does it is who the PI delegates. Now, if yeah, go ahead. Well, so long as the the um, the person that's being delegated that duty is allowed to do it according to the sponsor or CRO. Because again, this can vary from study to study. And state to state. And state to state. So maybe they only want an MD doing that specific scale. Or maybe they'll allow somebody who, with a master's degree in science or right. or less. Maybe a high school education is sufficient. So again, you need to know this criteria. It varies. Um, but typically, that's what the delegation of duties log is for. It's so that the PI can delegate who does certain assessments if it's not going to be the PI himself or herself. Now, you have to make sure that the person who has been delegated these duties um, are adequately trained and qualified to do it. Okay. Another question, can, and these are good questions. Thank you very much. Keep them coming. Um, another question, can you ask for the CRO to provide you source docs if you don't know how to do it or don't have time? Well, so the answer is yes, you can, but chances are you're they're going to tell you. Here, what, what's the answer? So here's what's going to happen. I would never, the question that you want to ask is, is the sponsor of CRO providing source documents? If they say no, they're not going to prepare them for you. So don't ask the question in that way. Just say, are they being provided? Because about 10 to 20% of the, of the time, the CRO or sponsor will provide source documents. And you often need to ask because your CRA, again, they're overwhelmed with their job as is. So they may not forward you on the source documents. So it's a good question to ask your CRA. Yeah. Uh, are source documents provided? Will source documents be provided? Correct. Will source documents be provided? So, and if they're not, sometimes they will send you something that will help you prepare source documents. They'll send you screenshots of EDC. They'll even sometimes send source documents from other sites that they have that have been prepared. Uh, that's happened on a number of trials where the CRA says, well, you know, another one of my sites, they gave me their source documents and I like them. So here they are. You can use them if you want or change them to your sites. And this happens. Right. Um, but you don't want to come off as necessarily a research naive site. So I would ask the question that way, just are the source documents provided? Right. Yeah, that's pretty much, I mean, the, the answer, the textbook answer is yes. Of course you can ask the CRO anything you want. Sometimes you get lucky and they'll give it to you. Like Chris said, 10 to 20% of the time they will provide it more often than not. However, they won't. Uh, sometimes like Chris alluded to, they will share a source doc from another site if the monitor is nice or if they like you. But you don't want to come off uh, as not knowing what you're doing. So you definitely don't want to tell them you don't know how to do it uh, or even that you don't have time. All right. So, yes, you can ask, but phrase, phrase the question properly. Will the sponsor be providing source documents? It's either going to be yes or no. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, another question. Can you use the EMR, the electronic medical record, as your source instead of separate source docs? No. Say it again. The answer to that is definitely no. Um, there, 
the purpose of the source documents is to capture information in regards to the study. So even if on the electronic medical records, it captures every bit of data that they're seeking for that particular study visit, um, it still isn't going to be what they're looking for. So an example would be on the electronic medical record, let's say it says there, two weeks ago, a patient was seen and this was their weight and this was their blood pressure. Well, that's not going to be what the the source document should entail. It should be specific to that date. Um, you're going to have to capture those individual items again because they're to be performed on the date that you're seeing that patient. Um, and not only that, but it, it would just, I mean, okay, let's say the electronic medical record was from that date. So the patient was first seen by the physician and then uh, consented to do the study and then was seen for the study. You're still going to want to move all the information to source documents because the CRA is not going to want to look over this electronic medical record and try and find everything in there, even if it is captured there. Yeah, source data, source documents, source data is very protocol specific. Many times they are also in order of time that the assessments need to be completed. It's very unlikely that all your EMRs are going to follow every single protocol. And capture everything that's required for that protocol. And capture everything that's required. I think you're confused here, and this is good. This is why we like these questions. You, as far as EMR, you can use those records as medical history, right? You can. Well, they now, typically want to see EMRs. They want, they want to see... Uh, EMRs. They want to see verification of diagnosis and this yes. type of thing. You yes. can't use it as a study visit. So, source doc is source doc. That's where you collect study data. EMRs is medical for history individual for individual visits. EMR is uh, medical history for a particular patient. Now, when you, you can print off the medical history from the EMR if you don't want to give your monitor access to the EMR, if you do, then that's fine. But if, if you don't, which many sites are not comfortable giving their monitors access, you print what's called a certified copy, which is push print. The PI gets the paper, signs and date it, probably writes a sentence, This I certify this is correct medical history, file that in the source document for that visit or, in, or under the medical history tab for the patient source folder. Okay, and then you got to enter the data in the EDC. So don't get confused with that. Okay, anything else? Is there any other questions? Not right now. So when we it's twelve twenty five, we still need to get into consenting. Yeah. Right. Yeah, consenting was the next step. Yeah. Patient, patient has come in for the first study visit. Patient and first let's patient, first visit. and people relate better to stories. So let me just scare you guys. So. I was dealing with a, Chris and I were dealing with a brand new site. Uh, the site was excited to get their first study. They obviously wanted to get the ball rolling. Uh, they were inexperienced and they made the same consenting mistake for all 30 patients that they screened. Then they randomized the subjects and then the sponsor came in and had a fit because they were not. Uh, consenting them properly and the site lost the study horrible way to start off so FDA will love this FDA will love this and here's here's the here this was the issue there so we're going to get into informed consents but in this case the site did the informed consent properly what they didn't do was follow their own SOP so in their SOP it says we have a informed consent checklist and so everyone who signs the informed consent we go through the checklist and we mark down that it happened well this checklist was only there for 20 percent of the informed consents so they were not following their own process somewhat ticky tack but it's a good lesson that if you're going to have something in your sops you need to follow it if you're not going to follow it don't put it in your sop Right? Yep. Okay, so consenting. Do you want to go through? Patient gets there. Informed consent is the first thing you need to do. Go for it, Chris. Okay, so 
yes, the absolute always first thing done is the consent uh, for research. Um, and as Dan alluded to, there are processes. So you, you need to follow both your SOPs, whatever they state and how the, the informed consent is conducted, as well as the guidelines established in GCP, um, as well as uh, the IRB. So there's three processes that need to be followed to consent a patient properly. Your site SOPs, what the individual IRB for this trial has stated is necessary, and just general GCP guidelines. Um, and I'll give you an example. So some SOPs require, like the sites that Dan and I own, require that the patient needs to initial and date each page to verify that they read that page as well as sign the document uh, where necessary. Um, oftentimes, IRBs do not require that the, the patient initial and date each page, and sometimes they do. So obviously, when it is required, there'll be a uh, printed space on the documents on each page requiring an initial and a date. Um, if that's not there because our site SOPs require it, they still need to, at the bottom of the page somewhere, initial and date. So you just need to make sure and follow the guidelines set forth by your SOPs as well as what the IRB is mandating. Now, uh, that being said, always follow uh, GCP guidelines because uh, there's uh, specific um, uh, steps that need to be taken to consent a patient. So do your GCP training and follow those guidelines always. Uh, it'll be things like the patient... Um, was given enough time to read the document. All qu uh, questions were answered prior to any assess uh, procedures being performed, these kind of things. And you need to state these things in a note somewhere or on your source that all these things were done. Um, what's, you know, in regards to what GCP mandates, you need to have that stated somewhere in the screening visit that these things were done. Right now, the FDA is looking very closely at the consenting process. So make sure and capture that information that everything in accordance with GCP was done. Not, not a sentence, but you have either a checklist in your source that these things were done or somebody writes a note, whether it be the PI or the coordinator, writes a note in their, their visit note that the, all these things were done. Um, so now that your consenting is, is completed, now you can start seeing the patient for the study and you're going to collect all the information that's required for that particular screening visit um, for the study and you'll complete your source documentation. You'll follow, follow your source documents uh, and if in the protocol it gives a timeline as things are to be completed, then you'll follow that as well. Um, just make sure and, and capture everything that's required for that study visit. Oftentimes, uh, sites will not do something required and the patient will have to come back to capture that, that data. And, you know, we want to be considerate and not have to have patients come back multiple times to the site for one visit, if, if at all possible. And I think we've covered everything. Am I leaving anything out? Uh, no, and get your final questions in. So... We're not really leaving anything out, but some other areas where sites may be having issues with, obviously the consent is important. Uh, if you already have a patient coming in, you want to make sure you have the screening lab kit there. You want to make sure you have the needles to draw the blood. You don't want to inconvenience the patient because it's one thing to piss off the sponsor, lose the study. I mean, that's one way to screw this up. Another way is to piss off the patient. It's hard to get patients. It's not easy. So if you're inconveniencing the patient and you're not you're not giving them confidence that you know what you're doing, if you're fumbling around looking for your lab kits or you're missing a needle to draw blood, like I know if I were the patient, I wouldn't tolerate that for very long. Um, so make sure you have everything in order. Make sure you're following the schedule of assessments. So in every protocol, a little cheat sheet called the schedule of assessments that should, be captured in source docs, that should be in the source docs and you need to follow but if if it's not in the source docs because a lot of these people are going to make their source docs for the first time 
Sure. What I'm saying is the schedule of assessments, everything that's to be done in a specific visit should be captured in your source documents. So you just follow your source documents. Right. But just to make sure, because some, these are newbies right. and some may be creating source docs and guess what? They might forget to put something in there. Sure. So you need to, everyone who's listening and watching, go to your protocol, make a copy of the schedule of assessments, put it on your wall, right? As long as you follow your source docs and you follow that, you're not going to forget anything. And if you follow the schedule of assessments and you notice that something's missing in your source docs, then you need to revise it. But if you're not doing that and you just follow your source docs, well, you might be repeating the same mistake over and over again until your monitor gets there and tells you, what are you doing? This protocol deviation. So schedule of assessments is one thing. Give the patient confidence that you know what you're doing. Have your lab kits ready. Have your ECG on hand. Most screening visits require ECG. Have your electrodes there. Um, what else? Uh, have the money for the patients there. Pay them. Yeah. Like if you're paying them cash or check, that's fine. But if you're paying them electronically somehow, and some studies have e-payments where they'll give you like a prepaid card, there's a system similar to IVRS where you need to log in and um, generate payment. So you don't want the patient waiting around for that. Oh, we did skip one thing. Go ahead. What, what did we skip? We skipped IVRS. So yeah. patient consents, after the patient consents, you need to enter them into IVRS. Or more, more often these days is IWRS. Right. So I, what they stand for is IVRS, Interactive Voice Response System. And uh, nobody calls too often anymore to utilize this service, um, though I think most of them still offer it. Uh, everybody works on the internet now, so it's interactive web response system. So you'll you'll have login information, you'll have a site that you have to go to to enter specific information about the patient. And then they'll assign a unique identifier to the patient. So patient's consented, now you need to get a, the patient number. You go to the system, you log in <clears throat> with your with your specific information to log in, and you'll have to enter like their birth date, uh, their sub their initials, and sometimes they want a little bit more information, but that's typically about it. And then they'll assign a number for that patient. And that will be the number you utilize for that patient in all research materials. They they don't want to know the patient's name. Uh, you never send the patient's name. That's that's protected. Uh, and the sponsor, the CRO, the FDA, they don't want to know the patient's name. So always the unique identifier that's assigned at that first visit, your screening visit. And then when you do your, your you process the labs, you draw their, their, um, their samples, uh, you'll put their unique identifier, their number on the requisition form. When you do your EKG, you will enter their, the unique identifier number there. Um, so that that's how you recognize the patient is by that number. Okay, two more questions. So maybe you can answer this one. Can you copy the schedule of assessments for source for each visit and highlight each visit what's needed and when completed you initial and date as a coordinator? Um, I'm not sure I'm understanding the question, but I'm going to guess my answer would be no. Again, I'm not sure I understand the question, but um, I mean, I, I actually, I take that back. I suppose you could do that. It just wouldn't look too good. It's like, so if you, if I understand the question correctly, if you took for the screening visit, the schedule of assessments, you put that in the stu stu uh, subject binder as your, source. as your source, and then you just hand wrote everything that needed to, yeah, to be captured. Initial... Right, like here's the vital signs, yeah. and here they are. It wouldn't look good. No, it wouldn't look good, but I suppose you could do it that way. Uh, but I wouldn't do it that way. I wouldn't recommend that. It wouldn't look too professional. Yeah. Uh, it's much better if you create source documents that capture everything that's in the schedule of assessments. Um, but I so, you know, so here's the rule, whatever's written on first to capture anything in regards to the study, that is the source document. So let's say, as Dan kind of gave a, an example earlier, let's say you were diligent and 
you created your source documents and you're seeing your first patient for the first time. So you got the schedule assessments out to make sure everything on your source documents is there. And you notice, hey, I, I didn't put down vital signs, right? So you think to yourself, well, I'll just put it on the post-it note for now and I'll revise the the source documents later to include vitals. So you write on, the, on a post-it note, you write the vitals, right? Their blood pressure, uh, maybe their weight, uh, say temperatures required, body temperature. So you write that all on a post-it note. Guess what? That is now supposed to be your source document. You're, what you would want to do is take that post-it note and staple it to the other source documents because that's the original. They don't they do not want you to transcribe information. And, and this person clarified they want to use the copy of the schedule of assessment as a checklist. Yeah, you, yeah, absolutely. I when in the past I perf- have prepared source documents, that is what I do, just to make sure everything is on the source documentation. But it's not a replacement for source docs, right? Yeah, whatever whatever system you want to utilize to create your source documents, absolutely, and, and that's exactly what I do when I've done it. Is okay. I've I've put vital signs on on the screening visit, so that's done. I put a line through it actually, but nonetheless, it's now done. And so on. So yeah, absolutely. You want to know what something cool, Chris? What's that? Do you know one of the services we provide in addition to finding studies, negotiating budgets, completing your feasibility surveys, uh, finding PIs for you, and everything else we offer sites? Yes. We create your source docs. Yeah, we do. And it's, and it's all inclusive at a flat monthly rate yeah. of... Dan and I do not do this too much anymore, but we do have a number of uh, employees that we delegate this task to. We have a team of people to do this. Uh, so just wanted to throw that in there. Two more questions. This We're going way over, but keep them coming. Uh, are you supposed to pay a patient on the same day, or can you give money at the end depending how far they got? So there's two ways of doing this. Yes, there's several ways of doing this. I, me, I don't know about Chris. I don't know. Uh, actually, we'll get your your opinion. Um, you need to check with your IRB first. That's number one, IRB. Whatever's in the consent is how you pay them. Now, sometimes the consent doesn't specify. Always? Okay. As a general rule for me, I always pay the patient when they finish that visit. I know some sites that hold out money until the end of the study, and the IRB could argue that that's coercive. Chris is shaking his head. Yeah, I'm shaking my head no. Uh, So when you do your initial uh, regulatory documents, you'll have, and it's escaping me at the moment, but your initial, uh, what's it called? The IRB? IRB questionnaire. The initial IRB questionnaire? Yeah. Is that what it's called? Yeah. For some reason, I don't think that's right. But okay, let's just say that's what it's called. Yeah, initial site submission. That's what it's called. So your initial site submission for the IRB. Now, this is assuming you're using central IRB. Um, And uh, not to be too confusing, but there's local IRBs as well. That's if you're working at a university or a hospital, they oftentimes have their own IRB. uh, And then you're going to be utilizing that. But most sites are going to be using a central IRB. I would say 95% of sites. So we're going to assume you're using a central IRB. Now you're going to have initial site submission form that you fill out for the IRB. And one of the questions on there is how are you going to pay the patients? And you can put down there any way that you wish to pay them. Um, The easiest way, I think, is to pay the patient at the end of, at the completion of each study visit. So uh, it'll ask for either... Uh, they're going to ask where they find the information, how you're going to pay the patient. So you you can either say you're going to find this from the CRO or sponsor. There's usually a radio button you click for that or other. And, you know, hundred percent of the time mine is other. And what I'll put on there is whatever we negotiated in the budget, how much the patient is going to get paid for each visit. Um, Let's for simplicity, let's say it's hundred dollars. So patient will be paid $100 at the completion of each visit. And that's the end of it. And that will go in your informed consent. Now, if you choose to pay them a different way, then you'll check other and you'll explain that. 
Now, as Dan had said, there are B may object, so you may need to change that. But I know a number of sites do utilize a, a number of different systems. Some of them don't pay the patient until the end of the trial at all. So if they're getting $100 per visit and there's 10 visits in the study, they'll get paid $1,000 at the end of the trial. But as Dan said, some IRBs see this with, as coercion. Um, but that's not to say an IRB won't approve it. And it's not, a, it's not an issue if you want to put something in there that's different than paying them at, at the end of each visit. Uh, just the IRB will need to approve it. And if they don't, it's not, they're not going to say you can't conduct the trial. They're just going to say, you know, we don't approve of this. You'll have to find a different way to pay the patient. And then you'll have to change it. Um, yep. So however you choose to do it, um, again, I think the simplest way to do it is, and I'm sure Dan agrees, is at the end of each study visit. Yeah, and the reason I say coercion, I personally know of some sites that uh, take advantage of their study participants. And especially for the mentally ill ones, for the schizophrenia studies, uh, I've just heard it way too many times. I know who the sites are. They use, they hold out on paying the patients as long as they can in order to increase and improve retention. Mm -hmm. And that's not a good thing, right? I mean, if, I were, if, if my goal were to increase retention by offering a payment at the end, then what I would propose to the IRB was we'll pay them X amount of dollars. And again, you'll want this approved by in your budget as well, but uh, just so you're not paying for it out of your own pocket. But um, I would propose to the IRB patient will be paid X amount of dollars at the completion of each visit and will be paid a bonus at the completion of the trial. So in other words, if they complete the entire trial, they will receive uh, an added bonus. So maybe they're getting hundred dollars per completed visit they'll get an additional $200 or 300 or whatever you want to propose at the completion of the trial. If you think that'll help with retention, again, your IRB is going to need to approve of this. Yeah. So I, I know these sites. I mean, if I were a patient, I would not do a study unless I'm getting paid every visit, even if money is not my motivation. All right. So there is one more thing we can talk about. I got a question uh, regarding the process of consent. Does that apply to this, or is that another video? No, we went into it. Okay, so someone's asking because they had a site selection visit, and they're being asked, what's the process of consent at your site? And this person didn't have an answer. Well, you need to... You want to go with that one? Sure. The answer is relatively simple. Um, again, just be very familiar with the GCP. Uh, any GCP certification is going to outline this. I mean, if it's credible. It's going to outline what your process should be. Um, and off the top of my head, your process should be, it's the first thing done. No uh, study specific protocol assessments. Uh, that's kind of garbled. So no, no specific, nothing specific to the trial is done prior to the patient consenting. The patient is given a, or let's start over again. The patient is taken to a private area to read the informed consent. So you take them to a room and they're by themselves. Uh, they're given enough time to review the consent. They are given the opportunity to ask questions. All questions are answered. Also, they would like to see that uh, alternatives are provided to participating in the trial. So let's say this is a depression study and it's a new drug. So basically what that means is you're going to cover what other therapies are available pharmaceutical therapies are available for depression that may benefit them um also oftentimes you'll be asked are they allowed to take the consent form home prior to consenting and your answer should be yes because maybe they want to go over uh, the study with a loved one who's not there so that's fine they can take the consent form and come back another day um also you need to provide a copy to the study participant. So once the consent form's been completed, you need to make a copy of that. So all signatures have been completed, the PI or the study coordinator, whoever's conducting the process, as well as the patient has signed, you need to give them a, a copy of that. And I might be leaving one or two things out. I haven't consented a patient in a very long time. Again, though, this is covered in GCP. If you, if you use a credible GCP certification uh, outlet, 
it, they will cover this. Which this, all of our clients are given. Yes, all of our clients are given. We give them a link to 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 get GCP certified, um, and it will go into great detail about this topic. So just follow your, your GCP guidelines. It will go into detail on what needs to be done, and then when you are asked by a CRA, what are your GCP? Or excuse me, what are your informed consent? What is your informed consent process? You will just recite what you learned from your GCP training. All right, thank you. We actually, oh, what link do you use for GCP? Is it the CITI site? I don't remember. We use something, I can tell you that. They're all pretty much the same. Uh, we actually give the link to our students in the CRA Academy as well as our clients. I'm pulling it up now on my Evernote. We use NIAID. NIAID. And uh, is that what it is? Yeah. Because I know we have two links and one is not that good. The one we've been using, the one I've been using. That's the one we've been using. NIAID? Okay. N N. I A I D National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Okay. And there is another one when that one doesn't work. It's gcp.nihtraining.com. That's the second one. It's the one I actually tell our students to use first. Um okay, one more question. Uh, does the PI need to be in room on consent day? Uh, depends on delegation of duties and the requirement of the IRB. I generally say yes. Okay, so oftentimes, um, <clears throat> oftentimes, I would say this is 50% of the time. The IRB is going to require that. Well, the ICF, the informed consent form, uh, can be delegated. So you can have somebody other than the PI performing uh, the task. It's still going to require the PI to sign off on the informed consent form. Um, so one, it depends on IRB requirements. Um, but oftentimes, again, 50% of the time it doesn't require the PI to sign off. So it can just be whoever's administering the form, the ICF. So obviously, if it requires the PI, then it does. Then the PI has to be there. But if it doesn't, then it can be anybody, anybody who's delegated that duty, uh, the study coordinator, a sub-investigator, whomever. Got a question. And we're going to wrap this up. We got some calls, but one more question. Why do the doctors refuse? And I said refuse what? So we're going to wait a little bit because okay. this could get good. Okay. This could be a nice little sound bite that we can splice. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's it's very vague, but I think I see where this is going. I have no idea. I would guess why do the doctors refuse to be in the room? To uh, do the informed consent form. And I would tell you. Well, it's required. They have to be. You probably have a doctor. That is used to having other people. Do everything for them. And. Now we're getting into a whole, whole other. Uh, right. Subject line. Right. If they're required to be in there. And again every study is different. Every IRB is different. Typically they do want the PI. To do the consent. However, sometimes a sub I can do it, and even a coordinator can do it. But the PI should have a footprint on the informed consent. You know, they would need to sign it after the coordinator signs it. Find out from the IRB, but I know doctors are busy. They're business people, and they're looking to delegate whatever they can. That's just reality. You don't really need to contact the IRB to find out. Again, your informed consent form will tell you. Just print it out and look at it requires the PI signature, then obviously they need to participate. If it doesn't, then whoever's delegated that task. However, as Dan's, uh, yeah, that's true. however Dan's 
what Dan's alluding to is they still kind of want to see the doctor's, the PI's footprint. So it would be nice if on the PI's note for the screening visit, it states that the informed consent was done and nothing was done prior to the patient consenting. So at least something like that, just so it shows the PI is aware the patient was consented and acknowledges that the, the proper informed consent procedure was, was done. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Yes, actually, very good point. If you see the doctor's signature required on the consent form, they have to be in the room to do the consent with the patient. If not, then it could be whoever's on the delegation of duties log to consent. Uh, thank you all for w listening. And for those of you on, for on YouTube watching in the future, this will be going up today. Uh, and, uh, we'll do one next month. I don't know on what, what do you want to do next month on what that question that we were guessing at that was very vague. We could do it on specifics and how research is conducted from site to site. Why do doctors refuse? Yeah. That could be a good title for the webinar. Sure. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for watching and or listening, and we'll do this again again. If you need our help for anything, we'd get you studies. We'll negotiate the budgets. We will create your SOPs for you, which are standard operating procedures. Uh, we will do the feasibility surveys for you. We will create source stocks, everything, flat monthly fee. We actually have several pricing options, so and a lot of it depends on where you're located. Yeah, I answered it. So they want us to do a web. Uh, let me. Uh, so we need we need people calling us for our consulting services. She asked, "What's an SOP?" I explained it. I just snuck it in there. We'll create your SOPs, which are standard operating procedures. Um, we'll do everything right. Pricing varies. The, we can do remotely. Yes, pricing varies depending on where you're located. Even then, we send out uh, quality assurance people to your site. We don't come, but we'll do everything oh, we yeah. can remotely. But yes. we even we even provide individuals that can help you with research. Nobody else is doing this, and it's very competitive. And we keep we are mindful of the fact that many of you are startups, and we actually have several options for the startups. Uh, so. We can talk privately about that. If you're interested, email me, dan at theclinicaltrailsguru.com. You can also call or text me, 949-415-6256. And um, they're suggesting that the next webinar should be on SOPs. Do you like this idea? I like my other thought better, but we could do one on SOPs at, at some point. Thought better. This is a teaser. Uh, why doctors refuse. That's the teaser? That's the teaser. Okay. Why doctors refuse? We will find out. I'm still trying to figure it out. Okay. All right. Thank you, Guru Nation. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone. And we will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.